I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your presence here with us this morning. Father, you know the burdens that each of us carry as we come to this place. As we come here this morning, as your people, your called out ones, to worship you here at Grace Community Church. And we ask that your blessing would be upon us. And I pray, Father, that your spirit would be at work in each of our hearts, causing us to confess sin, for we are sinners, but then also to encourage us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for our praise band. We pray for our other instrumentalists. We pray as we, we pray, as we read your word, as we hear your word expounded upon. May all these things bring honor and glory to your perfect matchless name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
thank you guys for leading us. Before, um, before we go to prayer, I just want to mention one announcement that I did forget was this will be the last Sunday that we'll be holding Sunday school until September the 10th, I believe it is. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to our faithful, faithful Sunday school teachers. Those who teach our adults, those who teach our children. We couldn't, I mean, we would miss so much without your study, your commitment to the word of God, your commitment to the church, and your commitment to our children, our students. So thank you. Thank you for your hard work and your care. And, um, and now um, we want to give you a break and give you a chance to recoup so you'll come back fresh in September, ready to do it all again. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning as your people, your people that have been called out, called out to serve you, to seek your face and to do your will in all things. We ask for your help in this matter, for we are weak, we are selfish. We seek to do things on our own. We seek to do things for ourselves, but we end up not doing a good job with them. So we need your help. We need a touch from you this morning, Lord, as we have gathered here to worship you. We thank you for the privilege that it is that we can can come here this morning and worship really not too concerned about being interrupted by the government or some other group. That's happened already in the past, obviously, but for the most part, we can expect a peaceful time together listening to you and hearing your still small voice. And we pray, Father, that that would continue for us that you would help us to be able to continue to do that. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of all of those who teach here at Grace, whether it's ladies' Bible study, children's ministry, discovery club on a Wednesday night, men's group, men's discipleship group, Those who preach and teach in Sunday school or in adult Sunday school, Father, thank you for each one who has a hand in that. Thank you for their faithfulness. And as faithful as they are, you are more faithful. We just sang about it. Great is your faithfulness. We thank you. Father, this morning we pray for the Hauser family, for Jim and Beth and Mark. We ask your blessing on this this family. Give them wisdom. Father, we pray for a, a, a restful summer for them. Give them wisdom into their future and the direction they should go. We thank you for Jim's place at Parkland, and we ask your blessing on him. Use him amongst those other teachers there, Lord. I pray that he could be a testimony. Pray for Beth and... And her work uh, situation at this point, we pray for Mark. And we pray that you would continue to bless him. We're glad to have him part of our church and youth group. We pray your blessings on him. We pray for our missionary family, the Van Wertz, Nick and Kelly, Levi Gage and Jameson. We ask that you would protect these Little boys, they seem to find ways to get into trouble. And we ask uh, your hand of mercy and grace to be upon them. As we pray that you're with all of our children, Lord, we pray that you would protect them, especially protect them from the evil one and the foolish ideas that are circulating around. 
in our society. Protect these guys. I pray for Nick and Kelly as they serve you at CMTS. Use Nick as the auto mechanic. I pray that, that he would be able to accomplish much and, and lead that shop. And we pray that you would bless his ministry and bless Kelly at home. Father, we pray for Trinity Baptist Church, our sister church, and, and our good friend Gary Morrison. We ask your blessing on him as perhaps he is even preaching right now. We ask for a strengthening for him, Lord. We pray for this world that we live in. There's persecution, there's violence, there's war, there's famine. There's all kinds of needs. Father, help us as a church to reach out to those needs and to meet them, help to meet them. Give us wisdom on how we can help. Father, bring peace to this world. We know that, we know that peace won't come until the Prince of Peace returns, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that Jesus would come quickly. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Father, protect our brothers and sisters in Africa, in Europe, in Asia places where they're under severe persecution. Oh, help them, Lord. Help, help these dear brothers and sisters. And then, Father, we pray that you would continue to win men and women, boys and girls, to yourself. We pray for Bible Adventure Week and ask that, that this would be a great week of, of sharing the gospel and, and, and having some of these children. We pray that many of these children would come to a saving knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. And then we pray for salvation for family and friends. I'm sure that every one of us here this morning has family, neighbors, friends who are outside of Christ. And we ask for you to bring them to a saving knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. We ask for revival to come to this, this old world. And again, we pray for salvation for many. Now we pray for our pastor. We pray for Pastor Taylor that you would use him to preach to us. May our hearts be open, our minds open to hear your word. We pray that your word would be a light unto our path and a, and a lamp to our feet and teach us so that we would then be doers of your word, not just hearers thereby forgetting, as we've looked into a mirror, forgetting what we look like. But may we hear your word and be doers. And all these things we ask in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 6. We're going to read a somewhat lengthy passage. Starting with verse 22, we will read through verse 58. You can follow along as I read the word of God. Think about it. The very word of God. Wow. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus has, had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do you not work for the food that perishes? But for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, 
This is the work of God, that you believe in him, him whom he sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we've no, we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life, and I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputing among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. The grass withers and the flesh and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Stand with me and let's sing hymn 52 and sing it together as we continue worshiping in song.
can open up your Bible to Mark chapter 6 this morning. I have a very vivid memory from when I was growing up. I don't know what age, some, as a young kid. Um, my family went to visit a cave. I also don't remember what cave it was, but it was a cave that was um, made by a stream that had kind of cut through the rock, um, and that stream was still flowing through the cave. And I remember we went and we took a tour of this, you know, cave system and, you know, they had the lights and the walkways, you know, it was all kind of made for tourism. And I remember that the tour guide told, told us, you know, that this stream went down into the earth and they had no idea where it came out again, despite trying to find out by letting stuff in. And, but one thing I remember most vividly is that in this cave, the water of the stream was crystal clear. At one point, you kind of walked along this path with the rail, and you could look down, straight down, into the stream. And I remember thinking and looking down that it looked like I could reach down my arm and, like, grab some stones off the bottom of the stream without even getting my elbow wet. That, you know, it looked like it was six inches deep. And yet the tour guide said that the water was so clear, it was actually over six feet deep at that point. I could have jumped in and submerged my entire body, and it looked like... I could have just reached to the bottom without even getting my elbow wet. Well, the reason I tell that is because our text this morning is in some ways like that clear water. It looks on the surface of it like it's a relatively just straightforward, simple narrative. It seems kind of mundane in a sense, you know, when you look at the backdrop of all the other things we've been seeing in the Gospels lately, right? What have we been seeing Jesus doing in the Gospels? We've been seeing him healing people. We saw him raise a little girl from the dead. We saw him still a storm, cast out a legion of demons. And compared to all that, this text kind of seems like, well, a little bit mundane because the miracle that Jesus does in our text this morning, the feeding of the 5,000, is just make a little bit of food into a lot more food, right? And so it seems rather mundane when you compare it to like casting out a legion of demons, raising a girl from the dead, stilling a storm. But that's just the surface. It appears mundane on the surface, but it is actually a very deep, deep text. Did you know that the feeding of the 5,000 is, apart from the resurrection of Christ, the only miracle included in all four Gospels? The only miracle that all four Gospel writers included is this miracle, apart from the resurrection, which they also include. That's kind of amazing, right? Even John, John wrote the last gospel. He wrote it towards the end of the first century. He had probably read at least, you know, Matthew and Mark, maybe Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he excluded a lot of things that those gospels contain. And yet, even John includes this miracle and attaches to it a large discourse, which Pastor John read for us this morning. This miracle was so significant that no gospel writer thought that he could leave it out, even though he had plenty of other things that Jesus did that he couldn't include because it would take too much space. So this miracle is a, is a deep, profound miracle. And what we're going to see this morning is it has a profound rootedness in the Old Testament and also a forward-looking expectation. So let's dive into our text this morning. I'm going to read for us Mark chapter 6, begin in verse 30 to verse 44. This is God's word. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? 
go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. So they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Let's ask for God's help this morning as we open his word. Our Heavenly Father, the God who never slumbers or sleeps but keeps watch over his people, I pray that you would awaken us this morning to the glory of your Son, the depth of your wisdom displayed in this text. Help us to see Christ more clearly and to worship him more truly. We ask this in his name. Amen. As you can see on the back of your uh, bulletins, we're going to be looking at four points this morning from our text. Four significances that this miracle reveals about Christ. And, and the first one that it reveals is the compassion of Christ. Remember the context. Uh, Jesus has just uh, sent out uh, a few maybe weeks ago, had sent out his disciples, sent them out into the surrounding countryside to minister two by two. And in verse 30, they just get back to Jesus. They get back from this first foray into ministry kind of without Christ. They've been following him around at this point. Now they've gone out, uh, ministered two by two, and they get back undoubtedly very weary, but also excited. And yet, with them comes a host of people. A whole host of people follow them back to Jesus so that it says that many were coming and going so that the disciples didn't even have time to eat. That's how busy they were. And seeing this, we see first Jesus' compassion upon his disciples. He sees how weary they are, that they have been working in ministry that he had sent them on, and now, even though they had come back, there was no rest for them. And so he calls them away, away from the public eye, to a desolate place, to a wilderness by themselves. And I want you to notice that this is not a suggestion for Jesus. Jesus actually commands his disciples. He says, come away by yourselves. That's a command and rest a while. He calls them away for a purpose of rest. He shows compassion on them. Undoubtedly, he could have said, this is a great opportunity. We're not going to miss out on it. Everyone's here. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going, keep doing ministry. But no, he saw how weary they were, and he called them away for time of rest. Now, already, for some of us, that's probably touching a nerve. Serving God can be and often is tiring. By the end of this week, many of us will know that from firsthand experience, that we will be tired physically from serving God. It's true that it's not always, you know, butterflies and roses when we're serving God. We know that serving God can be tiring. It can, it can make us feel run down and, and poured out. Paul even describes his own ministry in certain books as pouring out of a drink offering. He's pouring himself out. And the disciples had been doing that. And so we can sympathize with his disciples here, hopefully. If you've never gotten to a point where you can sympathize with his disciples, perhaps you need to consider whether you're only serving God when it's convenient for you. But I think most of us can probably sympathize that, yes, we have felt poured out, a bit burnt out, and run down because we've been serving God. And so just what I want to see briefly in this text, it's not the main point of the text. We'll get on to that. But just notice that Jesus is not a harsh taskmaster. Even in the work of the ministry, and perhaps especially in the work of the ministry, Jesus is not harsh, and he's not a taskmaster. He doesn't say to his disciples, I know you've just got back from your extended ministry trip, but look, we have all these people here. we got to keep going. Put your nose to the grindstone and grind, grind, grind until we get a break. No, he doesn't tell them to do that. He actually commands them, hey, take a step back. Go away by yourselves for a time of rest. He commands his disciples to do that. It's wise for us to also heed his commands. And there may be times in your life where you have been 
working for God and, and serving him, and you just need to take a step back for a little while and rest. Now, it doesn't mean that you take a step back forever and say, all right, I am done. I am never serving ever again. No, no. His disciples, they didn't like quit being disciples at that point, but he commanded them to, to take a step back, to go to a quiet place by themselves and to rest because he had compassion upon them. It's not the main point of our text, but I don't want us to miss the compassion that Christ had for his disciples in this context. So then they set off in a boat. They, they take heed of his command. They, they get in a boat. They set off to find a desolate place by themselves, but it doesn't work out. Unfortunately for them, the crowds recognize them in the boat um, and actually chase them along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. They were kind of skimming the shoreline, um, heading across, not across the really deep section to find a desolate place. And it says that the crowd recognized them and ran ahead of them at points to get to where they were going to land. Now, I can tell you right now then uh, what my sinful flesh would have been thinking if I were a disciple. My sinful flesh would have been in the boat, seeing the crowds, heading to where we're going to land, and I would have been like, all right, Jesus, let's turn this boat around. Let's head for the deep water where they can't follow. We need some quiet and peace. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus actually looks upon the crowd as they land sees the crowd gathered there, milling about, even though it is an inconvenience for them and a frustration. And it says that Jesus has compassion also on the crowds. And it says that he sees that they are like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep without a shepherd. Now, for first-time readers of the Gospel of Mark, um, this phrase probably just sounds like a prosaic phrase to, to convey how the crowd was probably just kind of milling about with no organization, no leadership, like a flock of sheep that had no one to corral them together. And that does, is what it conveys. But this is also a phrase, sheep without a shepherd, that has an Old Testament background. And so it's our first strand of the Old Testament that Mark is pulling, kind of showing us the deeper significance of this miracle that's going to take place. You see, the phrase, sheep without a shepherd, comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 27, verse 17. And the context is this. Um, God has just told Moses in Numbers 27 that he is to go up on a mountain and look over the Jordan River into the promised land. And he's to see it from afar, but he, Moses, will never enter it. And Moses, as soon as he goes up on the mountain and sees it, God actually tells him, and then you will die just like your brother Aaron died, and you'll be gathered to your father's. And so Moses, hearing God tell him about his impending death, that he will not enter the promised land as the leader of God's people, he prays to God, God, give this people a leader. L listen to what he prays in verses 16 and 17 of Numbers 27. He says this, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. Appoint a leader for your people, Lord, that they would not be a sheep without a shepherd. God's response then to Moses is to say to Moses, okay, go appoint Joshua, this man. And it actually, God describes Joshua as a man in whom is the spirit. This is an intentional allusion by Mark to this text. Moses is about to die, and he prays to God, appoint a leader so that your people might not be a sheep without a shepherd. And God says, it will be a man named Joshua who has the spirit. Now, for first-time readers of Mark, they might not have gotten that, but as they read it and became more familiar with the Old Testament, this is something they would have picked up on, and it's something that would have been easier for them than it is for us, probably, because if they were likely familiar with the Greek Old Testament, they would have known that Joshua and Jesus in Greek is the same name. It's Jesus. When you read the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, it's all about how this guy, Jesus, or if you're going to translate into Jesus, G, into English, Jesus did all these things and led God people in the conquest. It's the same exact name. And so by referencing that text, Mark is intentionally alluding to the fact that here is Jesus, the greater Joshua the leader of God's people, the one in whom is the fullness of the Spirit. 
And this is confirmed as throughout the Old Testament, the leaders of God's people are called shepherds. They're referred to as shepherds again and again. But as time goes on in the Old Testament, these shepherds of God's people become more and more corrupt, more and more false, more and more neglectful. So that by the time of the exile in Ezekiel, you get God's ferocious condemnation of the shepherds so that he will say to the shepherds that though they call themselves shepherds, they are not in reality shepherds. They have fleeced the sheep, used the sheep for their own gain and fed off the sheep. So when Jesus here sees them as the people as sheep without a shepherd, he's seen that that situation has not changed. The religious leaders are corrupt, more concerned with getting the right number of tassels than they are with true righteousness. And their political leaders are pawns of a pagan empire. And remember that the political leader of this region, Herod, had just executed the last faithful shepherd of God's people, John the Baptist. And so Jesus sees this situation of the people. They have no leader. They have no spiritual leader. And he begins to act as their shepherd. And that touches on another Old Testament prophecy as well. This time also from Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37 After indicting the shepherds of Israel for not being shepherds, God gives a prophecy through Ezekiel, and he says this, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. And so what we see already is that Mark is revealing to us how how this text is much more than just about feeding with physical food. This text is portraying Jesus as the greater Joshua, the son of David, the true shepherd of God's people who will care for them because unlike the evil, wicked shepherds that the God people had experienced for hundreds of years, this is a shepherd that has compassion upon them. And that brings us to our second point then, the provision of Christ for his people. Seeing that they are like sheep without a shepherd, Jesus immediately begins to act as their shepherd. And notice the very first thing he does. It's not what you might expect. He begins to act as their shepherd by teaching them. It says that he began to teach them many things. This is a consistent theme throughout Mark. We've seen this over and over again, that though Mark doesn't include the extended discourses like Matthew and John do, we don't get pages upon pages of Jesus just talking with no interruption. Mark doesn't include that. But consistently, Mark views Jesus as a teacher. Every time we see him engage in ministry, it's always like in the context of teaching. All the miracles and the healings are pretty much in the context of Jesus' teaching. And so before we get to the miracle that Jesus is going to work, we need to sit with this for a moment and recognize that the most pressing need that Jesus identified that this crowd had was the need to be taught. When he saw them as sheep without a shepherd, the need that he saw that they needed to have met first was to be taught. This was a crowd that lacked teaching. It lacked the truth. There's many today that probably would think that Jesus got it wrong. That, you know, we can agree that our culture, really, is, you know, you look around the world, it's, it's like sheep without a shepherd. Everyone going their own way. No spiritual leadership. And yet there are many today that say, well, you know, people just need to know their worth. Or they just need to know that they are cared for and to be loved. And those are all good things. Yes, those are all good things. But, but Jesus primarily put the truth as the first thing. And says that these people need to know the truth. Church, perhaps one of the most important things that we can do as a church is be a church that follows in the footsteps of Jesus in prioritizing the truth. And that means more than just having a doctrinally correct statement of faith on our website that we read every other year at our annual meeting. That that is a good thing. We need to have a confessional standard, but it means more than that. It means that we need to be a congregation that seeks the truth, knows the truth, and passes on the truth. This is one reason why teaching is and will remain a central part of our ministry at Grace, is because the church is not a social club. It's not just a place where we can get 
together and have fun, though we prioritize relationships as well. And it's not just an aid organization where we meet humanitarian needs, though we partner with organizations that do that as well. But primarily the church is an assembly of sinners called out of darkness into the kingdom of God and at its center is a message about Jesus Christ. So Jesus, as the shepherd, teaches the crowd and leaves for us an example of what shepherding means. In the first place, it means teaching truth. But then he goes on. It appears that that Jesus taught them for many hours because it approaches dinner time. And as it approaches dinner time, Jesus' disciples approach Jesus as well. Um, With a reminder, uh, we don't get their exact words, but probably something like, hey, Jesus, did you notice it's getting dark? Maybe you should should consider like bringing it to your conclusion, wrapping it up, letting the crowds go home so they can buy something to eat from the surrounding villages and and towns. Uh, But Jesus replies to them, uh, why don't you find something to eat for this crowd? And I can't help but think that Jesus, as he said that, to them had a sly smile on his face. Um, we learn in the Gospel of John and John's account of this miracle that Jesus said this to them to test them because he knew what he was going to do the whole way, the whole time. And so he says, why don't you find something to eat for them? To which they give a sarcastic answer. They say this, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And I think that's sarcastic um, because of the amount listed. To us, 200 denarii doesn't sound too much, right? We, we don't work in denarii, so we don't really grasp that. Um, it doesn't sound like too much, but a denarius was not the equivalent of a dollar. Now, so, so when you hear 200 denarii, don't think $200. A denarius was one day's wage for a laborer at the time. So when you hear 200 denarii, think 200 days wages, about nine to 10 months wages, roughly about $40,000. That's what they're asking him here. They're asking him, should we go spend $40,000 to buy enough bread for this crowd to eat? You can't be serious. This is not a legitimate option, I think, that they're asking Jesus about. Because let alone the amount, just consider the absurdity of 12 men trying to go and find a little town that had $40,000 worth of bread for sale and then transporting it back. They're not really suggesting this. They're saying, what are we supposed to do? We can't feed this crowd. But Jesus had a plan. He didn't want them to go out and buy food. He, he, he then says to them, all right, how much do you have? How many loaves do you have? And they, and they come back to him after taking count. And they say, we've got five loaves and two fish. Which, if you think about it, it's kind of barely enough for Jesus and his disciples to eat a small meal. Like maybe, maybe 13 men could eat a small meal with five loaves and two fish, a brunch. But Jesus takes those and he commands the crowd to sit down in orderly groups. And he takes the five loaves, two fish, lifts them up, gives thanks for them, breaks them apart, gives them to his disciples, and they pass it out to the crowd. And I want us to notice how this text ends. It, it says that they all ate. Let me read from verses, um, f- uh, just verse 42. It says this, And they all ate and were satisfied. And then continue on. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. There's a progression here. The whole crowd eats. And not only that, but the whole crowd eats and is satisfied. Jesus didn't just give them a morsel. It's not that they each took like a tiny little, you know, crumb of bread and a tiny little bit of fish. No, they, they eat until they're full. And not only that, but afterwards, Jesus' disciples each go out and collect a big basket full of leftovers. And not only that, but Mark tells us the crowd was 5,000 men. And he specifically uses the word for men here that is gender specific, not generic. Meaning that there were more than 5,000 total because he's not including the women and children. Matthew explicitly says 5,000 men apart from women and children. So the crowd was likely much larger than 5,000. And they all eat and are satisfied and there is an abundance of leftover. This just shows us the kind of God that Jesus is. He's not a God who holds back the best and only gives out a miserly morsel. He doesn't give half-heartedly. 
He doesn't reserve the best. No, this is a God who gives generously to meet every need with an abundance left over. I also want you to notice that we don't get an actual account of when the miracle took place, right? You read Mark, actually you read the other uh, uh, gospels too, you won't find an account of when the actual mechanics of the miracle took place. Like, well, well did the loaves multiply in Jesus' in Jesus's hands, in his disciples' hands, as the crowd ripped off pieces? The gospel writers aren't really concerned with that. What they're concerned with is the significance that the fact of the miracle reveals. And here again, it's deeper than it seems. On the surface, Jesus is just meeting the physical hunger of a large crowd. But it is deeper than that. There are two Old Testament texts, two more, that stand behind this miracle. And the first one, some of you are probably thinking of, it's the paradigmatic bread miracle in the Old Testament, the giving of manna in the wilderness. Don't lose uh, sight of the fact that when Jesus performs this miracle, he is in a desolate place, a wilderness the same place that Israel was in when God gave them manna from heaven and provided for their hunger. The second Old Testament passage that lies behind this is from 2 Kings 4. This is a more obscure text, but as I read it, one that you'll clearly see the parallel with ours. 2 Kings 4, verse 42 to 44, says this. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread from the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. See the parallel? Obscure miracle in the Old Testament, but in both you have a supply of food, an insufficient supply of food, a man of God commanding his servant to give it out, the objection of the servant, a miraculous multiplication, and leftovers remaining. And so we see here that Mark is drawing two more themes together, two more threads from the Old Testament to reveal the type of Christ that Jesus is, the type of Messiah he is. He's a Messiah who fulfills the giving of the manna in the Old Testament, who is himself, as we see in the Gospel of John, the bread of life. He is the greater Elisha. And remember, Elisha himself was the man who received a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and yet he only fed a hundred men. This is the type of Messiah that Christ is the one who draws together all those different themes of the Old Testament and they find their fulfillment in him. He provides for his people in an even greater way than ever has ever happened before. But this miracle doesn't only point to the fact of his provision for his people, but as we'll see, points beyond the mere fact of it to actually how does Christ provide for his people. And, and it goes beyond just providing physical bread and fish for them to eat. And what I think it says is that this miracle points to the fact that Jesus will be the provision for his people, leading them in a new exodus from spiritual slavery. Let me give you a few reasons why I think that. First, in the Gospel of John, John notes that this miracle occurred on the eve of the Passover. That means early April, on the eve of the Passover. And what does Passover signify, right? Passover was the great Old Testament festival that remembered Israel's redemption from Egypt and how the angel of death passed over them because of the blood of a lamb put on their doorposts. It was their ritual meal remembering their redemption out of slavery in Egypt. And, and John notes that this miracle occurs on the eve of Passover, just shortly before it. Second, the order of verbs and the verbs that Jesus uses in our text is the exact same order that he uses when he institutes the Lord's Supper. Let me read you two verses. First, the verse 41 from our text says this, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing 
and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. Four verbs in that order. Now Mark 14, 22, instituting the Lord's Supper, says this. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them, and said, take and eat, this is my body. Mark clearly intends us to pick up on the parallel between those. Four verbs, the exact same, in the exact same order. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. It's clear that Mark here is seeing this miracle as a foreshadowing of that greater giving, that greater meal that Christ will institute before his crucifixion. And so what Mark wants us to see in this text is not merely that Christ provides for the physical needs of the crowd, but that ultimately he will provide for his people by giving them himself. And that's what we saw in the text that Pastor John read this morning, right? Listen to just a few verses from that. Jesus says, and this is, again, put in in John right after the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down for heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so this text points us beyond the fact, the fact of provision for God's people to the passion of Christ, which is how he accomplishes that. He gives himself freely, out of compassion, to meet his people's every need, to meet our every need. One more point then before we close, because I don't think this text stops here. In fact, I think that there are indications in our text that there is a even further future-oriented aspect to it. And that is that in this feeding of the 5,000, we are to see a small, shadowy type of the consummation of all things, the new heavens and the new earth. Let me give you three reasons why I think that. First, in verse 39, when Mark says that Jesus uh, told the crowd to sit down in groups, he uses a very specific word. And that word is could be translated, uh, probably is more accurately translated, festive company. In other words, it's a party word. He tells them to sit down in parties, in festive groups. Um, in the book of Esther, it's a word that, that is used for Esther's party that she throws for King Artaxerxes, right? It's a party word. And in the, in the literature between the Old and New Testament, it's used again and again for these parties, these festivities, And so there's an undoubtedly festive connotation to this word, which which doesn't quite maybe fit the context of our miracle. And so it's intentional that Mark uses it here. That's the first reason. Second reason is that elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus clearly and repeatedly refers to the consummation using the imagery of a feast or a party. He even compares it uh, multiple times to a wedding reception, kind of that paradigmatic, joyous feast. And then third reason why I think this is future-oriented towards the consummation is that when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, which we already saw as a kind of rhyming meal to this meal, he himself pointed forward to that future time. Listen to what he says. Mark 14, 25, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This miracle pointed forward in a shadowy way to that future consummation, that future feast that we will have with Christ in the new creation. The crowd did not understand all of this. Um, It's actually debatable whether the crowd even knew a miracle had occurred Uh, because we don't get any indication that they were amazed or anything like that. They might have just thought that, you know, they happened to have a lot of food nearby. The crowd did not understand all of this. And and guess what? Next week, we're going to see Jesus' disciples did not understand this week. Jesus is going to chide his disciples, did you not understand the miracle of the loaves? But Mark is presenting it to us and drawing together all these themes to show us this deep, deep well 
of the sufficiency of Christ. In this miracle, we see that Christ is the leader of God's people, the true and greater Joshua filled with the Spirit who provides for his people in their need. We see that he is the greater Elisha, the sufficient provider for his people, not only physically, but spiritually. We see that he does that out of his compassion. And we see that he does that by giving them himself. It is a pointing forward to the fact that Christ is the bread of life that has come down from heaven. And ultimately, he will provide for his people by giving them himself. And so to us this morning, I'd like to ask you, have you partaken of this bread of life? Jesus says that he who eats this bread will live forever. It's not like the manna that the Israelites ate in the wilderness. They ate the manna and they still died. It was mere physical bread. And the bread that this crowd ate was mere physical bread, but it was pointing to who Christ is, the bread come down from heaven. And the one who eats of that by trusting in him and receiving him will not die, but have everlasting life. So have you eaten of this bread? Have you partook of Christ? Is he your Lord? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I ask that you would work by your spirit in us this morning. I pray that each one of us would not neglect the gift that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ. You have given him for us. He came willingly and gave himself for us to meet our needs. Lord, I pray that we would know that he is sufficient to meet our every need that there is no sin for which he cannot atone for, no darkness and trouble that he cannot rescue us out of. And so I pray this morning that we would come to him, that we would be given eyes of faith that are not dull to his glory, but that we would see him and see his beauty and be compelled to trust in him as our Lord and Savior. We pray that you would do that work among us. And for those of us who have trusted in him, for whom he has been Lord and Savior for years, I pray that you would renew our vision of him. Give us a fresh and deeper understanding of his beauty, his compassion for us, and the sufficiency of his work for us. And I pray this in his name, the name of Jesus. We pray this, amen. Please stand with me as we close our service by singing our final hymn, hymn number 92, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
creation, pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation, perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Church, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you.